And so do we want to just uh, go kind of down the line? Sure. I'm Alex Matthews. I'm the National Chair of Restore the Fourth, a civil liberties organization with chapters across the country. And locally have done some work with the pirates and I encourage contacts between pirates in other states and our chapters as appropriate. I'm Stephen Presser. Um, I and my colleague Mike here are here to talk to you about a national court case that has significant privacy implications. Uh, I'm Steve Revelock. Um, I'm the treasurer of the Massachusetts Pirate Party. I'm also a town meeting member in Arlington, and what I'm going to be talking about is uh, some efforts of uh, introducing local state or, or local surveillance ordinances in my community. So, how did I cuss to begin? But by, by means. Okay, so um, fine. Insofar as I have a mandate for this talk, it's to give an overview of the um, state of play on the discussion over mass surveillance um, nationally and internationally. So I will try not to take too long, but I should start with the um, f news that broke yesterday relating to the NSA um, f and their declaration that they would stop what they call about collection. Um, this has been a highly controversial surveillance practice ever since it was revealed as part of the Snowden revelations. And um, what it is, is that um, the NSA spits up the different kinds of surveillance that it does. Um, for under different legal authorities and different program names. Um, in this case, this is surveillance occurring under Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, which is the statute that retroactively legitimated a great deal of the Bush administration's post-9-11 surveillance regime. Um, one of the programs under 702 is called Upstream, and under that program, the NSA um, taps into undersea cables and intercepts um, for all um, for communications transiting that cable um, on a mass basis. They're taking everything, but they hold it on a rolling basis. Um, of possibly 90 days, there's a little ambiguity about the length of time that they retain it. And then they pass it through the, their algorithms to identify suspicious content that after five or six layers of um, automated review would eventually come before the eyes of an analyst if considered to be part of a suspicious enough pattern. Um, about surveillance is where you have person A talking about, talk, talking to person B about person C, um, where person C is a target of surveillance under Section 702. And so it, um, if, say, I and Jamie were um, communicating via email, um, for, about Edward Snowden, which of course we have never done, um, then it is a potential example of about surveillance. But um, as far as the declarations of the intelligence community have been, um, it would only be about surveillance if we were using an email address of Snowden or another specific identifier of Snowden, such as say, at Snowden, because that's his, um, for, uh, his Twitter moniker. Um, so within those constraints, um, about collection sweeps up the commu communications of people who are neither suspicious in themselves or communicating with somebody who is suspicious, but they are discussing somebody who is suspicious um, according to the NSA's lights. Um, now, the, um, this is a practice that 
inevitably sweeps up a large number of communications that are from one US person to another. Um, and it was particularly controversial for that reason. Now, Section 702 is currently up for renewal in December of 2017. It's the largest surveillance reform fight of this year and probably for several years. Um, and as part of that, part of the impulse in the NSA doing this may be to terminate one of their more controversial types of surveillance under this authority so that they, they can then get a clean reauthorization for five years of um, Section 702 and then potentially even restart about collection. There's nothing about what they've done that says that they can't restart it. Um, the, uh, um, f when it comes to um, f the immediate sort of causes of, what, of why this may have happened, it looks like the Fo Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which is the su secret court overseeing surveillance matters, um, <coughs> decided to refuse to renew their Section 702 surveillance certificates unless they decided to abandon about surveillance. And that was pretty much at the discretion of the individual FISA court judge who was ruling on it. And so maybe the NSA got an unlucky draw for their judge, and maybe that's all there is to it. Or maybe there is this broader political ag agenda to insulate from broader reform. But that's kind of what appears to be happening. Obviously, this is a very recently breaking story. And so I can guarantee that we don't have all of the parameters of why it is happening yet. But when it comes to surveillance reform, um, we are intensely advocating for the sunsetting of these authorities on schedule um, or failing that for very substantial reforms to the type of surveillance that is happening. Um, one principal problem with the kind of surveillance that is occurring is that um, Section 702 covers um, US person to foreign person surveillance where the foreigner is a target that has been identified for some reason. Um, the, um, f and the surveillance that is done, um, they, they collect a large amount of information through what up until yesterday we understood they were calling PRISM, now they are calling it downstream collection. Um, and so they, are, they have touch points at different techs, tech companies, major tech companies, where, whereby they are intercepting, in the case of what used to be called PRISM, the metadata of communications, and in the case of upstream, the content of communications. Um, the, um, and once they have gathered that data and parsed it, then they can then share that information onward with the FBI, or as I now like to call it, President Trump and Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III's FBI. Um, I have certain concerns about them doing that, but the restrictions on that sharing were actually lifted in January before Trump took office. Um, so that was an Obama thing. Um, and even previous to that, there have been relatively few restrictions on sharing. What this means is that if FBI gets a tip based on NSA data of any crime, no matter how m minor, it can go down to um, minor drug possession as far as we know, then they can um, do what's called a backdoor search on that data, find out more about that communication, and then um, work to sanitize the source of that information um, to develop an alternate evidentiary stream um, that would mean that they can then pr um, prosecute the person for the crime that they know that they did because it was disclosed in the NSA communications. Um, but using only evidence that is not derived from the NSA directly. This practice is called parallel construction, and honestly we don't know how many prosecutions in the United States are based on parallel constructed NSA data. Um, there is no systematic information on how much of the legal system has been corrupted in this way. And I say corrupted because every defendant 
is supposed in our system to have the right to confront the evidence against them and challenge the evidence against them in court. And that includes the manner <coughs> by which that evidence was collected. But the structure of backdoor search and then parallel construction prevents people from being able to challenge in court these mass surveillance programs. And indeed, that's the entire point of having these systems. The NSA wants to do it, but they don't want to do it in such a way that their systems would be challenged substantively in court. Um, so that is the kind of NSA surveillance that has the potential to affect the most of our everyday lives. Um, and that is the nexus of the current surveillance reform fight. And it is completely different from the fight that was happening a couple years ago over whether NSA should be allowed to collect the metadata on all telephone calls in the United States. That, there was a whole process of discussion and partial reform over that, um, but that's a teeny tiny corner of NSA surveillance collection. Really minimal, and in fact, the former director of the NSA, um, after that fight was over, said, you know, phew, I didn't think that we were going to get out of this whole thing with only reforming the metadata, um, the phone metadata collection. But hey, um, the big enchilada is the Section 702 stuff that is up this year. And so the big fight is still to come. And with that, I will break. And we're here to talk about that tiny little corner. If you'll give me just a minute. I Go ahead. I have notes. <laughs> no, no, neat. In, in August of last year, 20, I'm sorry, in April 2015, 2015, 2016, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court issued, a, uh, under the new Free USA Freedom Act, issued the first time a, a certification of a question of law to its supervising court of review. FICOR itself has only met three times. Uh, no FISA case has ever gotten to the Supreme Court yet. We actually tried to take a whack at it, and we're still in the process of doing that. But essentially, the important question that was raised in the FICOR opinion was whether or not uh, pen registers can reach content data. Dating all the way back into the 1980s, there's a case called Smith versus Maryland that draws a distinction between the contents of a communication, which are protected by the Fourth Amendment, and metadata, which is not. This is envelope information, where it's going, who it's from, that kind of stuff. Although metadata can be very revealing, as was discussed in the telephone dispute, uh, essentially what happened is FICOR decided that under the the pen register statute, there's a domestic one under Title 18, which is the criminal code, and then there is uh, the regular FISA Act, but they both share a common definition of what a pen register is involving DRAS, which is directional routing addressing in the signals data. Okay, so um, to, give, to give the case a name, um, we've been calling it Fisker 1601 or FICOR 1601. As Mike mentioned, FICOR is the FISA Court of Review. When we hear the FISA court referred to, that's usually the lower court where everything starts. The FISA court of review has met, as far as we know, three times in 38 or 39 years now. They don't talk a lot. Um, essentially, since the FISA court is a one-sided court, there's nobody to challenge things to the upper court. Um, also, so Fisker 1601 is all about pen registers. Um, you got kind of a brief, but does anybody want me to explain pen registers more? Hands up? Yes. Okay. Um, so pen registers are all about telephone metadata. They're about who you call, who calls you, how long the conversation is, um, and things like that. One of the ongoing, does, does that explain sufficiently? Okay. One of the ongoing issues with the pen registers is, um, they call it post cut through dialing data. Um, essentially, when you call someone, you dial your 10 digits, the phone rings, someone picks up. You can still dial phone numbers after somebody picks up, you know, automated prompts, whatever. Those are post cut through dialing digits. Um, the law is not entirely clear on whether that's content or whether it's DRAS, dialing, routing, addressing, signaling information. The court, uh, excuse me, the law enforcement is, maintains that they're entitled to it as it's DRAS. Um, and, you know, sort of the issue is, is it DRAS or is it not? In the open courts, this question has come up, and every single court has punted it by saying, it doesn't matter if it's DRAS or not, there's too much risk of, um, of capturing content instead of capturing just your, your metadata. Um, so 
the FICOR found the, went into the law and found something called the savings clause. Um, the savings clause is essentially, the general interpretation is that a savings clause is, okay, well, something's not supposed to happen, but it does occasionally happen, so let's make sure that it can't be misused. Um, so in this context, that is, there are pen registers that collect metadata. Every once in a while, they might collect something that's not metadata. Um, and the savings clause says that if the government gets something that's not metadata, they're not allowed to use it in court. FICOR took this and said, well, if there is a specific bit of law that says they can't use it in court, then there must be a way that they can get it or that piece of law is useless. Um, so that was the major basis of their decision. I should also note that because the content is Fourth Amendment protected, it requires a search warrant. A judge actually has to look at it and say there's probable cause of a crime here and let it go into it like a real wiretap. But because pen registers do not, there is no, no testing of whether or not there's a sufficient showing. The, you know, you can piss off the police, a, the police officer who pulls you over for a speeding ticket and he can decide that he'd like a pen register on you. It doesn't really require much in the way of showing other than the government check off the right boxes as it goes down the form. So we took this decision and tried to appeal it to the Supreme Court. This is a Supreme Court brief, if you've never seen one. I've never seen one. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Um, so we, you know, it was kind of a, a project. We expected to go there. We expected the Supreme Court to come back and say something along the lines of, you don't have standing to sue. We don't understand how you're, you know, you, you, you don't have the ability to come. This is not harming you. You don't have the ability to come and challenge it. That's not what happened. We actually didn't get to the point where the court was able to say that. What did happen is probably unethical, probably also illegal. Um, there's the clerk of the Supreme Court, you know, just does all this kind of paper passing stuff to make the court work. The clerk's job is to take things like that, stamp a brief number on it, and hand them out to the justices. We got back a letter from the clerk that says, we don't understand how you have standing for this. Now, not having standing is a valid reason for a brief to be rejected, but standing is a question of law and needs to be made, the determination needs to be made by the justices, not by the clerk. If the justices had come back and said, you don't have standing, we would have just taken it. But that made us mad. So we're continuing to fight that one. Um, do you want to take how we're fighting it? Uh, among other things, we intend to bring within the next couple of weeks a petition for reconsideration. We're going to actually ask the FISA, the FISA Court of Review to take a second look at its decision to see if they, because apparently under the Supreme Court clerk's interpretation, we actually have to get FICOR to let us appeal to the Supreme Court because, again, it's only one-sided and you have to be dubbed an amicus in order to be able to have to participate in the proceeding, and so until we're dubbed amicus like some kind of knight, uh, the Supreme Court won't even talk to us. But we've also been uh, wrote a reform to the law to try and fix this this hole and to clarify appeals from the FICOR up to the Supreme Court. Right now, that we hope that our representatives are going to file that in Congress. We've written the bill and submitted it, and we're lobbying them as we speak. Um, one of the major grounds on which we wish to challenge it is that. Um, when the government was arguing their case in front of FICOR, they said basically, when you dial a digit after the phone connects, we can't tell if it's routing data, well, what the intent is essentially. We can't tell if it's supposed to be a number, to like a, a phone number, or if it's supposed to be part of, say, your bank pin for telephone banking. One of the things in here is a piece of code that I wrote that will do that. So we have a, a pretty good argument here that the government missed something, and since the court relies on the government for their information, it's time for the court to reconsider. Okay. Um, if you would, if you could let me into your laptop. <laughs> so I do have a, I do have a few, a few pictures. While they're doing that, I Go ahead. Oh, so you wrote code that determines that whether. Yes. Yes. So the government made a very specific and very tightly held argument. They argued that you can't tell if any individual digit is part of is content or is not content. No, because the technological stuff doesn't. What I did is I broadened what we're looking at. So instead of looking at 
each individual digit, we're looking at you know, where is their voice in the call, where is their silence in the call, using that, and, and where are their digits, of course. Using that to group the digits and then looking at the format of the digits and saying, is this telephone number or is this you know, an American Express credit card number? Um, there also, of course, is a whole, it, essentially what happens is, is that it, if you've ever, think back to the old days where you had to call the operator and then you put in a calling card number, the, the NSA is essentially wants the ability to get the second routing of the call because they're entitled to DRAS data. But they say that because they can't tell the difference between dialed digits and not, they want the ability to invade this here, hitherto unimpinged sphere of content, and they've successfully done it. Uh, going forward, there literally is no difference between di dialing in your American Express card or, or, or transferring money from a bank account and you know having the operator connect you through to someone else. And they're going to hoover it all up into whatever processes they so use. The piece of that phone call has no constitutional That's what they determined. So, um, what about people who have, I think you mentioned it, somebody mentioned it, that there are people who are being tried. Can you hook up with them and say that they okay? Because if you don't have any standing, you a test case. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Can you uh, we've been trying to, but there, uh, it's uh, after Mr. Snowden did his uh, large document dump, people have become far more aware of what's going on, and everyone's starting to network and group together, and folks like the ACLU and the EFF and, and, and Restore the Fourth are working on it. We've chosen to call ourselves Thaw America, but we're, we're hoping, we're looking for test cases, we really are to try and see if there's any way of, of, of working on it. Unfortunately, because everything is secret, the FISA court, literally, this brief is entitled, An Unknown United States Person Versus the United States, because we don't know who it is. All we know is it's a cell phone of a US person. But I promise we are looking. We did have a, a local judge, Judge Young, who was starting to dig into all of this secret FISA stuff and, and looking. And essentially, the conclusion he came to was that he wasn't allowed to talk about any of it, but the government is probably right with the arguments that they make. But because it's all secret, Not, no one would believe him anyway. He, he thinks they're right. Um, but nobody, it, it's secret, so nobody even knows, not even the defendant really knows what he was looking at. Do you mind if I, if you have time, if have time to ask Why don't we go up and see? I just yeah. wanted to know how we got into it. You can tell me that about afterwards, maybe? Because I'm kind of curious. Sure. Okay. So um, my name is Steve. I live in Arlington, Massachusetts. I'm going to talk about surveillance on a more local level, uh, like really, really local, 50 feet from your house, uh, the other side of the street, the block next to you kind of, kind of level. So one day, um, Jamie over there visits me every once in a while to get together and talk about things. And uh, one day he came over and said, hey, what, when did the cameras go up? I said, gee, Jamie, what cameras are you talking about? Um, and it turned out that there, uh, on a phone pole, like, you know, a house down from me, there were two surveillance cameras. You can see them in the photo right here. That's the first one. Um, so this is a utility pole, um, you know, with, you know, power lines and cable lines. And, um, you know, here's the, here's the camera. This line is the camera feed. And we have two high K vision uh, networked uh, four megapixel cameras with infrared and the, you know, the whole nine yards. They're, they're fairly nice cameras, but, you know, what are they doing there? Uh, there are three more of these right on another phone pole right across the street. This pole doesn't have any utility lines on it. It, um, you know, whereas this one is a uh, Verizon, formerly Bell Atlantic, this is actually, this one's actually a piece of private property. Um, so, the, yeah, this is across, this is two houses down across the street and at the other end of the block. Uh, so this is a, a fisheye camera. Um, right, this little guy down here, that is a microwave antenna, uh, a little transmitter, and that's just on another uh, utility pole. If this were, you know, you could see down lower, there would be a street light here. So, well, when, when something like this happens, um, you know, gosh, like, who do you, where, where do you start, to start looking? Um, because these were utility poles and they are, Know, considered the private property of the utility company, I started by calling the calling our local police department. Did you guys put these poles up, and, or put the poles up, put the cameras up? They said no, we did not put the cameras up. So the next clue is, well, the cameras on the pole next to my house are the same type as the ones on the pole uh, on the housing authority's property. So I live next to um, uh, a set of. You know, a set of lot loaned by owned by the Arlington Housing Authority, 
And it turns out that they were the ones who put the cameras up. And they said, it's yes, we did. We're putting them up to protect our property. And fine, um, you know, with the housing authority, um, you know, I started looking into, well, they, I found out that they are a, what, what's called a quasi-government agency, where they uh, administer programs from the Department of uh, D, State, DHCD, yes, uh, the Department of um, Health and, is it Health Housing, and Community Development. Housing and Community Development. And so they have, but they're not, uh, they're located in individual towns, but they're not technically respond, accountable to the towns. But anyway, they own a bunch of houses. They decided to put up a bunch of cameras. Uh, they have a board of directors. The board of directors has public meetings. So we go to a public meeting and just ask, you know, ex my, you know, my neighbors and I are concerned about these cameras. And could you ex did you you put the you admit to putting them up? Could you explain a little why? And we got the whole spiel about, you know, reducing crime, public safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they also said that the how they didn't think it was necessarily such a big deal that they put the cameras up because hey, we've got hundreds of video feeds. Well, wonderful. Um, I want to. I got a map, a couple maps of the housing authority properties uh, because that part is, you know, that that is public record. Uh, and I want to hopped on my bike, went around, and just kind of sketched them all out on a map, um, and then went home and put them onto OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is kind of nice because it's, you know, it's it's, you know, what you would call open source map data. Um, they generally your you know, if you create an account, you're allowed to contribute to the map. And one of the things that, um, you know, surveillance camera is a first class item. So you can just say, okay, this surveillance camera, and I put in a little information. And after, you know, after doing that, um, with uh, a little, the help of a little project that Jamie did, CCTV, NASPirates.org, which pulls down all of the surveillance cameras in OpenStreetMap, we start making some maps. So, um, you know, this is, the block where uh, where or so I'm I'm kind of over here. This is the block where the cameras all appeared. Uh, so you can see that they're kind of clustered. So this house has six cameras on the outside. This one, uh, you got three on a pole. You got another two on one side. You got two on the other side. And here's that do fish eye dome. Uh, the housing authority also owns uh, this block. So 15 cameras here went up within the space of a week and a half. So they've got another 11 here um, that have been up and some are newer than others. Uh, another housing authority property is down here. This is a, a little development called Drake Village. Uh, it's got, I believe, 21 cameras and it houses, uh, it's housing for elderly and disabled per persons. Um, so at any rate, they, they, have quite a, they have quite a few cameras. So what, um, what, so go to the public meeting, show up, um, and aside from doing that, I'd also been following um, what's called CCOPS. This is Community Control of Police Surveillance, but I think, you know, Community Control of Housing Authority Surveillance is, you know, is also an appropriate thing to do. Uh, Cambridge's City Council heard, uh, first heard a, uh, an ordinance proposal on this, and I guess it's, you know, in, or in committee and being discussed and that sort of thing. Um, it will shortly be referred through to committee, but uh, we're having discussions with the city manager because the city manager um, doesn't like much the idea of there being oversight over the kinds of surveillance that city agencies can put in. So uh, okay. We're, the, that work is ongoing. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, I'm also aware of that other communities have ordinances about you know, surveillance cameras. Uh, Santa Clara has one, uh, Santa Clara County, uh, which Restore the Fourth um, yes. so did some significant work on. If I may take half a minute just to explain oh, what these ordinances are. So the general purpose of these ordinances, um, which we're partnering with um, ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation on to get passed, is for any surveillance technology broadly defined, if a city agency wants to introduce them, or in Steve's case, a town agency, then they have to actually tell the elected officials that it's going to come in. And what's more, they have to have a plan for how the technology will be deployed and what will be done with the data. 
And before they deploy it, the, city, the municipal officials have to have a public hearing and they have to vote on whether the plan is acceptable. Then the agency has to report back regularly to the elected officials on whether the actual use of the surveillance technology matches up with the plan. And if they do not comply with these requirements but introduce surveillance technology anyway, then that is a misdemeanor. So as Steve referred to, the first of these ordinances passed in Santa Clara County, um, California in June of last year. And in Massachusetts, the main campaigns for moving it forward have been in Cambridge and Somerville and Boston at this point. Okay, so having followed some of that, I, the, um, the, housing, you know, the housing authority putting up a pile of cameras in my neighborhood decided that, well, Arlington probably needs this kind of, uh, kind of ordinance too. So I you know, pulled paperwork and decided to uh, propose a warrant article. So in a town warrant article, so in a town, a legislative body is called town meeting, uh, and warrant articles are sort of the agenda for a town meeting. They set the scope of what the uh, the meeting can discuss and decide to do. So this is this was my first draft, um, and the, you know print's pretty small, but it it basically enumerates the things that Alex um, Alex mentioned. So beforehand. If you plan to deploy a piece of surveillance technology, there has to be, you have to tell people about it. Uh, in particular, you have to tell your residents about it and you have to hold a public meeting so that they can, um, you know, where you, where you try to justify why you're doing it and your residents can express their concerns about what you're trying to do. Um, you know, we also, also requiring um, usage policy. So what will this information be used for? Uh, requiring reporting, so every so often you have to say how the collected information was used, and then you can compare the two to see if the proposed use was the same as the, um, you know, the actual use. And privacy impact assessments, you know, who's going to be affected by this? Are marginalized communities going to be affected by this? Do you have a plan to mitigate the effects of that? So that sort of stuff. Um, I w sh sent this to our town council, and um, he's a good guy. Um, he said, well, I'm afraid that we, under, under the town's legal structure, you can't actually do this. So because this would be considered department policy, and, we, the, and um, the town's legislator is, legislature town meeting has basically uh, delegated that to the town manager. So we don't have the authority to do something like that. So what, what could we do? Well, you could either do a study group or you could do a non-binding proposal. Fine, take two would be the study group. And so this is the actual uh, warrant article that was submitted and I went around and gathered signatures on it. But you know, to see if the town will vote to form a group to study the use of surveillance te technologies by town agencies, to study the impact of such surveillance technologies on privacy, civil liberties, and human rights, to determine if policy, oversight, or public input framework frameworks might be appropriate for the town or take any action related thereto. So got the signatures, got this on the warrant. And during, um, you know, during the warrant article hearing, a warrant article hearing is sort of when you go before the board of selectmen, the executive body of the town, and they, you know, they look at it and they decide to make a recommendation on whether it should go forward and, you know, propose some specifics because this, you know, this says what you'd like to do, but it doesn't, there's no, there are no implementation details here. So the selectmen um, thought this would be a good thing for the town to do, um, and they decided to form this committee themselves. Um, so we're in the middle of town meeting session right now, um, so that tends to be a busy time for everyone. Uh, the, what's coming before town meeting is a, what's called a no action vote, which basically the, the selectmen decided to do it themselves, so town meeting doesn't need to do anything. Um, I'm waiting for the call for, um, uh, they plan to put out, put out an advertisement for uh, people to participate in the committee or the study group, and I'm you know, looking forward to, to putting my name in. So, but okay, so that's one way to push back. 
Um, now, in terms of other ways that you can push back about th on these sort of things, so going back a couple of slides, you see that um, I n I've noted that a couple of cameras were removed. So when you, um, so the, I asked the housing authority, um, you put cameras on a utility pole that's owned by Verizon. Did you get Verizon's permission to do this? And shortly later, the cameras came down. Came down. Um, another interesting, you know, that wire that ran crossways, it also, that ran, you know, the camera's here, there's a house here, the wire ran across the house, or across the road and was connected to it and hooked up to the house. Here there's another scenario, we've got a camera here, um, cabled across the road, hooked up here. I asked the housing authority, may I see a copy of the permit for running cables across a public way? Cables came down very shortly afterwards. Um, this camera, it's, um, the antenna is, has been unplugged, um, but it's still up there and I may have to ask Verizon um, if the housing authority put, you know, got their permission to put up their cameras on their pole. Um, and if so, what is your, you know, like what's your general policy about, you know, outside agencies hanging s equipment on your pole? Uh, otherwise known as, can I hang my equipment on your phone pole as well? <laughs> but you know, we'll we'll see we'll see where that goes. Now, since I had been you know doing this, I you know tried to arm myself with a with a bit of research because the public safety argument is always going to be always going to be the first justification. So my question was, well, how often do or how effective are cameras as, um, you know, as, you know, to, um, to help, yeah, yeah to, to prevent crime? Is there a deterrent value? And luckily there is some good research on, out there. Uh, the UK has Home Office Report 292. Uh, the UK has, I think, the highest concentration of surveillance cameras per person. It's something like, you know, 14 people per camera. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But they've also done, you know, they've done studies on it. And the one study that they have out of, you know, maybe 14 big projects, the one study where there was a very positive effect, it was in a parking garage. So if you take, and it turns out that they didn't try to control the study for just the cameras. Uh, they, you know, put the cameras in at the same time they did uh, lighting improvements and put up new fences and hired more security staff. But, you know, when they, the cameras were one component in a broader picture, and you can say that the broader picture made a very significant improvement. Um, in other cases, you know, there's there's less of an improvement. Um, San Francisco, uh, part of their community safety camera program requires an audit, so they had um, researchers from U UC Berkeley come in and audit them. Um, and there's between you know these two and a couple of others, there's some really interesting interesting stuff and one of the, you know like one of the takeaways that the UK report offers is um, after 20 years we're really not sure how well this stuff works because in some cases you'll see uh, small but statistically significant improvements in some cases you will see um, small but statistically significant um, increases in crime and in some cases well there's you know we're not sure what's you know it's still it's noise there's it could go up a little bit could go down uh, the one cons one of the things that there seems to be consensus about is that um, the cameras have a may have a deterrent effect on property crime so breaking uh, stealing stuff out of a car or stealing you know stealing a bicycle they have no effect on on violent crime so we're talking things like muggings rapes um, you know, assault, battery, uh, prostitution, no effect on prostitution, drug, uh, drug transactions, no effect on drug transactions. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, um, they're, they're, they've, they seem to be less, they're less helpful than one would intuit, or at least the camera proponents would like us to intuit. Um, you know, and the other thing I learned about it is that, you know, in a sense, these are big information technology projects. And anyone who's ever worked on a big information technology project knows that there is a ton of policy 
uh, and a ton of planning and execution that goes into how well it works. Um, the San Francisco project is, is a good example of where, you know, if you don't get the policy right, it really kind of messes things up. Um, so initially, you know, they had, you know, if you wanted to, they'd put up some cameras, and if the police wanted, um, you know, the police wanted to, um, you know, see the footage, well, they, because the, the cameras are a police program, the way they did it is the footage is owned by the IT department, so you got to run down to the city's IT department and make an appointment and go look at your footage there. And like with with them, the it really broke down to is, um, you know, there were four departments in the city that ran the program, but none of them, well, that were involved in the program, but none of them ran it. And if you wanted to get something done, the first thing you had to do was argue about who was going, who was the right person to contact in order to do it. So like, you know, bureaucracy makes a difference. So the one point I, I do want to, um, we do want to, um, I do want to make is that it is possible to fight back on this stuff and uh, make some differences at least, you know, local locally. Um, I have collected a, a pile of resources um, and there's a URL here where sort of I've just been sticking stuff that I collect so I have it handy and so that um, other people who are doing the same similar work um, can have access to it as well. So, um, do we? Any, so, how do you how are you guys feeling about surveillance? Any questions? One will it end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for when will it end? That's a you know. I understand that at some point the sun is going to become a red giant and it's going to swallow <laughs> the earth. About five billion years. Yes. I think there are several interesting things about your observation there. Um, one is that when it comes to um, local elected officials, the voice of the police chief is very strong and for historical reasons, um, the towns and cities are used to deferring to the police chief and giving the police chief a great deal of discretion over the kind of equipment that they acquire, whether that's surveillance equipment or military style equipment. It is very, very frequent for the police chief simply to acquire the equipment without getting sign off from anybody. Um, and that is a culture that we are trying to change. Um, we've done a lot of work on the topic of body cams. In fact, our local chapter um, is responsible for interest introducing um, privacy-friendly legislation on Beacon Hill relating to um, police body cams. Um, and it, it, 
the, there is a strong impulse among police to um, to be interested in these te technologies only insofar as they provide a mechanism for better enforcement of law, but to be strongly disinterested in anything that might provide accountability for police actions. And um, so we, it, it, it's been a difficult bill because even at the Beacon Hill level, the default is that law enforcement comes in um, uniformed, they get priority in giving testimony, and the opinions that they voice are weighted very strongly when it comes to the Joint Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security, which is um, the relevant committee for this kind of legislation. I have one more point on that. Uh, this, I've been saying this for years, whether the Libertarian Party or anywhere else, I said the single most important thing you can do is just go run for local office. You have no idea how important it is to run for local office. I agree completely. <laughs> The answer to that is a couple of different questions. Massachusetts actually, <clears throat> for all of its flaws, has one of the most advanced privacy statutes in the nation. Uh, we have a, uh, I believe it's chapter 214, section 1A. It is a tort which, it is a civil tort which can also be prosecuted separately as a crime, which uh, makes it illegal for anyone to do anything that constitutes an unreasonable and unwarranted invasion of privacy. Uh, it is it is an incredibly wide open tort. Courts have used it to look at uh, drug testing of civil employees, cameras, and other kinds of things. Uh, there, there, in terms of the requirements to keep the information secure, uh, there is a I think it's 93H or 93I. Look at me, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Which, which governs uh, if you have personally identifiable information, that you can stretch and massage that statute to say that uh, if you can identify a face on a camera, that you have to keep the information secure from hacking and, and, and make sure that you disclose it in appropriately responsible ways according to a policy. And that also, likewise, has a criminal penalty attached if you don't follow it properly. It's not by its express terms, but it's one of those statutes that are written so broadly that you could massage your way into it if you wanted to. Well, I, as long as it's looking at what's in the public, and then it doesn't again, it doesn't constitute that unwarranted or unreasonable invasion. Um, oh, yeah, as long as it's the point public, or your own property. At common law, there are four civil torts for invasion of privacy, and Massachusetts. I think the one is is false light, which Massachusetts does not recognize. False light is where you take true things and you put them that are, and you you put the like editing of someone's quote to take it out of context and you put it out there and Massachusetts, the SJC has for years refused to recognize that tort. But other than that, there's, the protections are kind of patchwork other than that, that incredible uh, right to privacy statute 214. 
So yeah, I mean, in in doing my research, um, you know, rec more in more recent years, the UK has something called the Information Commissioner's Office, and if you're a private individual and you have a camera, um, you know, you're more or less given free reign to record your what happens on your property. Once you re start recording things in public spaces. Um, you, there are actual requirements for what requirements around that. Um, I am not aware of anything like that in the, um, you know, in the, you know, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that the police like being photographed either. Uh, there's a PINAC group that, that's, that's pretty good about that too. Any, anything else? If that, I think we're done. Perfect. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.